Last week, we did a bonus deep dive into the arrest of Josh Duggar. Now, most of you know that Josh Duggar got famous on the reality show 19 Kids and Counting that followed his very, very, very conservative Christian family who allegedly practices what is called Quiverful. Now again, Quiverful is not its own church, it's just a movement. And the Quiverful movement can be found in many religions all over the world. However, it is very commonly practiced in independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. Now again, that's not saying that every independent fundamentalist Baptist church practices quiverful or that every member in the church practices quiverful. However, that is where it's most commonly seen. Now again, I want to make it very clear that just because Josh Duggar grew up in this movement and in the IBLP, that does not mean that this movement or the IBLP are responsible for the allegations against Josh or any of Josh's issues that he had in the past. But in saying that, because of the IBLP's attitude towards these types of issues, I do believe that Josh's issues were able to grow and fester. As I said last week, this is not normally something that I would cover on this channel. However, I am a fan of the show 19 Kids and Counting, so I am pretty familiar with the Duggar family. And I also know that Josh has ties to Washington, D.C., which we talked about in our last episode covering this subject. That episode will be down in the description box below for any who missed it. Of course, we know that there is a lot of bad behavior in Washington, D.C. and in governments all over the world, so my direct interest in Josh Duggar's case with the federal government, with Homeland Security involving CP, really comes down to his connections to DC and if perhaps he could be the straw that breaks the camel's back. After we finished our episode last week, I had a lot of people request a deep dive into Bill Gothard and the IBLP. Once again, I do not hold Bill Gothard or the IBLP responsible for Josh's alleged actions. Every human being is responsible for his or her own actions. However, I do personally believe that the IBLP and Bill Gothard are dangerous. I want to make it very clear that even though this is technically a Christian organization, in my opinion, this view on Christianity is not Christianity. That doesn't mean that there aren't good people in the organization and people that have good hearts and who love the Lord and are true Christians. It is just my opinion that the perspectives and the teachings of the IBLP are toxic and, again, dangerous. With that being said, if subjects like CP or ABUSE are triggering to you, I would suggest not watching this video, and we'll see you again on the next video. I also have included some resources down in the description box below for you to do your own further research on the matter. And there's also a couple of websites in the description box below if you are struggling with recovering from a high controlled group like the IBLP and need a support system from others who have also been in your shoes. With that being said, let's get started. Bill Gothard was born on the 2nd of November, 1934. He was the third of six children. His mother was a woman named Carmen Gothard. Now, I've heard other people say her name was Christina, but on the IBLP's own website, where I got the bulk of this information, it lists her name as Carmen. So I'm going to go with Carmen. His father was William Gothard Sr., now, when we look at things like CULTs or high controlled groups, we really have to look at the leader and the leader's own trauma and upbringing to see how it's spun in such a toxic organization. And it's very telling given 
Gothard's own childhood. So according to the IBLP website, William was recognized as the president of the Chicago Business Paper Association and the vice president of the National Conference of Paper Editors. Allegedly, he received many awards for his skills. According to the IBLP website, it appears that William Gothard, Bill Gothard's father, left his pretty prestigious role as an editor because of advertising differences he had with the company. It appears that the company wanted to run ads involving alcohol and his father was very much against that. Now I know in a lot of conservative Christian circles people do not drink. I personally don't have a problem with people drink even though I myself am not a big drinker. I exercise way too much to be able to drink regularly, but I'm not against it. If you can control it yourself, then why not? We also know that Jesus himself turned water into wine, so, you know, there's that. Because of this issue regarding the advertising of alcohol, William Gothard left his job. Now, this was risky because According to the website, it didn't seem like he had a backup job. It was more of a moralistic principal reason for him to leave. At that point, he became the executive director of the Gideons International. Yes, that Gideons. If you have ever stayed in a hotel, you've probably seen the little Gideons Bible that they leave in the hotel. Same company. So all of a sudden, this father of Bill Gothard, who was really really ethical and did not want to advertise alcohol, had this great job as an editor, obviously was a really good editor because he apparently won some awards. He leaves because he doesn't want to advertise alcohol and now he's been offered a job with the Gideon International, which of course their whole thing is spreading the word of God. Hence all the Bibles found still to this day in hotel rooms. After the Gideons International, William Gothard went on to work with organizations like the Chicago Christian Businessmen's Connection, the Child Evangelism Fellowship, and the Pacific Guardian Mission, which apparently he helped with a radio program that was called Unshacked, which again kind of reminds me of like the people on TV who are like, evangelizing and it's a huge production and, and and it kind of seems like this might have been like the door cracking into what would eventually become Bill Gothard's life. Now again according to the IBLP website Bill Gothard accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior when he was in the fifth grade. And a lot of really interesting things started to happen to him when he was in elementary school. Allegedly, Bill Gothard really, really struggled in school. He probably had some sort of learning disabilities, and just because a person has a learning disability does not make them stupid. It just means that their brain works a little differently than the average student. Most people I know with learning disabilities are actually some of the smartest people I know. They're highly intelligent. I mean, think about it this way. Allegedly, Albert Einstein himself, quote unquote, had a learning disability. It just means your brain doesn't work like the average student. And back in Bill Gothard's time, there probably was not a lot of resources to help him. And I can imagine that this situation was probably very traumatic for Bill. I know that when you're that young, being the odd ball, the, the odd man out, kind of the black sheep of the classroom, can cause a lot of PTSD, a lot of trauma, a lot of anxiety. And children who go through anxiety or trauma at a very, very young age can snowball into personality disorders like narcissism. That's not always the case. There are a lot of kids who go through trauma at a very young age and they do not turn out to be narcissists or anything like that. But for a lot of narcissists, you can trace it back to some trigger that happened when they were children. Now again, before I get into this, as I said with Josh Duggar's video, I am not a therapist. I am not educated in psychology. I've just had a lot of experience with therapy myself. I, I have been the victim of 
of a narcissist before, so I have gone through a lot of therapy for that, for my own PTSD. And if you've ever been a victim of a narcissist, then you probably have done a lot of research yourself into narcissistic personality disorder, so you probably know what I'm saying. You have some information to give. However, this is not me diagnosing Bill Gothard. This is just in my opinion and just something interesting to possibly, maybe, again, allegedly in my opinion, point to where this personality disorder started within Gothard's mind. So because of his hardship in school, he did have to repeat the first grade and almost had to repeat the second grade, but it seems like they just kind of pushed him along year after year after year after year. It seems that he really struggled with reading and retaining information. So I would assume that means that test taking was probably really hard for him. Test taking is hard for a lot of people. You don't necessarily have to have a learning disability to struggle with test taking. Some people just don't do well under pressure, myself included. But it seems that this really bothered him because according to some of my research, once he got to high school, he really tried to commit himself to his academics. He spent a lot of extra time buckling down and really trying to study. But according to my research, even that massive amount of studying didn't do him any good. He still really, really, really struggled. Now again, according to my research, at 15 years old, by recommendation by a teacher, he started to memorize scripture as to a way to help him with his academics. Now, when my mother was a child, she used to tell us all the time that they would have to memorize poetry like every week and recite poems in front of the class. And I know that is an exercise with your brain to help you memorize and regurgitate and retain information. So even though that could have been something that was inspired by God, we see this same type of exercise done with other things that are not scripture related. But regardless, after this happened, after he started memorizing these Bible verses, he started to excel in his academics. Now around the same time, at the age of 15, here Bill Gothard is, he's figured out a way to kind of combat his learning disabilities. He's also heavily involved in his church organizations. He had accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior in the fifth grade. And so I feel like what starts to happen with Gothard at this point is what we can call spiritual manipulation. This is really common with CULT leaders. And because of Gothard's perceived miracle, where all of a sudden he's memorizing this biblical scripture and his grades are getting better, he sees himself, in my opinion, as someone who has maybe been ordained by God. Like, he's special. Now, again, with narcissistic personality disorder, as I heard one therapist say once, it's like in a healthy mind, someone who's not narcissistic, they will see themselves as a special flower that's beautifully and made and unique to themselves, but they will also recognize that everybody else is also a special flower that's beautifully and uniquely made for themselves. But a narcissist will see themselves as the only beautifully and specially made flower in a land full of weeds. And at 15, after he had figured out that he could memorize these Bible verses to help him with school, he then all of a sudden started looking around his whole high school and seeing all these teenagers that were, you know, having these teenage problems, and he decided that he was going to try to counsel them. But the real yikes part of this whole situation isn't just that he thought that he had the wherewithal and the grace to counsel him peers his own age as a child, but allegedly he also thought that he could start counseling their parents. Now again, in my opinion, this is an example of spiritual manipulation. You see this a lot in many different organizations where the leader will tell people that they have some divine connection to God that other people don't have. 
And I'm going to give you an example of from my personal life of where I believe there was some spiritual manipulation. Now, in my daily life off of YouTube, I am a yoga teacher. Now, there are a lot of different yoga communities that definitely could be considered CULTs. And in our shala, our yoga school here in Atlanta, my boyfriend and I very much try to maintain it just as a yoga school and nothing else. Our teacher in India runs his shala, his yoga school, very much like a yoga school. We don't live on the, the campus. We don't, he's not responsible for our housing or anything else. We just go there to take classes and sit through conferences, very much just like a school. But when you're dealing with things like religion, spirituality, churches, yoga schools, you are, for the most part, dealing with people who are vulnerable. Nobody gets out of this world alive. We all have our fair share of crosses to bear. We all have to go through suffering. So for each of us, there's always going to come a point in our life where we could be very vulnerable to CULTs. And unfortunately, people who are narcissistic or antisocial personality disorder, whatever the case may be, they prey off of that vulnerability. It gives them narcissistic supply. And in order to pull these victims in, they sometimes use tactics that is called spiritual manipulation. So again, in my community, there is another teacher who wrote a book about being um, a drug addict. And allegedly, this particular person used to use needles. And in this book that this person wrote, he claims that the practice of yoga got rid of his scars, which is complete baloney. That doesn't happen. I have scars on my body, not from anything that was self-induced. I've had my, when I was 12, I had an appendectomy. I have a scar going across my stomach. I've had back surgery. I have a scar on my hand from when my hand got caught in the door as a kid. We all have scars under my chin from falling off the bed. We all have bumps and bruises that are permanently on our body just from being alive. And I'm here to tell you, with the years of yoga that I've practiced, my scars have not gone away, nor will they. That's not what the practice of yoga is for. However, by saying that the practice of yoga got rid of self-induced scars is a, way, is a form of spiritual manipulation. Like, oh, look at me, I'm so special. I understand this practice so well that my scars are gone. Why would God or the universe get rid of scars for somebody who gave those scars to themselves versus an innocent child who has scars that weren't self-inflicted? It just doesn't even make sense. Nor is it scientifically possible. So that is an example of spiritual manipulation. I have all the answers. This is what happened to me. Somehow I have a connection to the guru or to God or whatever that you don't have. So therefore you need to listen to me because I am the prophet. I am the special one. I tell you what to do. I control you. And what happened with Gothard, in my opinion, is exactly that. When his grades started to improve, he somehow thought that that was because he was special. And even though everybody is special, in my opinion, it seems like he all of a sudden thought he was the only one who was special. He was like the modern day Moses. And such a red flag that at 15, he thought that he had the superiority and the authority to counsel not only his own peers, but their parents as well. Gothard graduated from high school in 1954. Allegedly, he did graduate on the Honor Society. And allegedly, he was offered a scholarship to Harvard. He ended up going to Wheaton College in 1957. He graduated with his BA. And in 1961, he graduated with a master's. He was ordained in 1964. He started to work with inner city kids in Chicago, mostly gangs, to help them resolve their conflicts. 
He called his new organization the Basic Youth Conflict. In 1974, he changed the name to the Institute of Basic Youth Conflict. And around this time, he started traveling around giving these seminars all over the country. And his seminars started to pick up popularity. These were 30-hour seminars, and up to this point, it's attracted like 2.5 million people. Now, something interesting to notice about the timeline of these events, in the documentary, The C-U-L-T Next Door, they bring up the idea of the hippie movement. We see this, like, counterculture happening on our timeline across the globe in the Western world at this time, where young people are kind of revolting against the traditional norms of society. We also see things like free love and a lot of um, excessive psychedelic use. And because this counterculture of the hippies was so extreme from the traditional values, Gothard's seminars all of a sudden started to become the counterculture to the counterculture that was countering the traditional values. So if you have the traditional values here in the middle, you have the hippies over here, and you've got Gothard over there. The pendulum is swinging side to side. And so for these people who were super like grossed out by the hippie movement, they found themselves wandering over to Gothard's camp, where things were way more fundamentalist, legalistic, hardcore traditional values. In fact, at this point, it was common to see about 16,000 people in just one of his seminars. In 1984, Gothard decided that he was going to develop his own learning institution. Allegedly, he originally wanted to create a boarding school situation, which is horrifying knowing what we know about Gothard now, but that did not come to fruition, thankfully. And so the ATI became a homeschooling program. The original name for the ATI was the Advanced Training Institution of America. Now it is just the Advanced Training Institution the of America has been removed from the title. In 1989, Bill Gothard changed his organization's name to the Institute in Basic Life Principles, or the IBLP as it is known today. This organization really engulfed everything we see going on with Bill Gothard and his what I believe is a CULT. By 1989, Bill Gothard was the president of the IBLP as well as one of the board members. Now, it is possible to use the IBLP organization without actually using the ATI or the homeschooling program that's associated with the organization. But since most of the people in this movement, or a vast majority of the people in this movement, are practicing things like Quiverful, which again we covered in the Josh Duggar video, a lot of these families are going to be using his homeschooling program. Now, according to the ATI's website, which I have included down in the description box below, the ATI curriculum uses the teachings of Jesus Christ given in the Sermon on the Mount as the primary source for teaching linguistics, law, history, science, and medicine. Now, there are a lot of homeschooling programs out there that are incredible. There are a lot of really, really great parents that are able to conduct schools out of their home and their kids come out with a great education. But unfortunately, for my opinion, that is not the ATI. The ATI works off of the umbrella concept, which is also in the IBLP. This is the umbrella concept that everybody has a place in their line of authority. First, it's Christ. He's the big umbrella. Then it's the priest. Then it's the husband. And then it's the wife who governs the children in the house. According to a lot of the survivors of the IBLP, Gothard, and I'm totally paraphrasing what they've said, Gothard runs this umbrella like it is the law of God. And that if you follow your authority, so if you're a woman, if you follow everything your husband says, and your husband follows everything the priest says, and the priest follow everything Gothard says, who then apparently, allegedly, thinks he has some divine line to God that nobody else has, then you will be blessed by God. 
But if you defy authority, well, then you will be open up to the attacks of Satan. In this very fundamentalist group of people, women, of course, are taught to be homemakers and to have as many children as she possibly can. Now, there is nothing wrong with this. My sister is a home homemaker. She's a great mom. She's pregnant with her third child, but she's also college educated. And if any time she wanted to go back to work, her husband would probably be totally fine with that. But from what I understand with these fundamentalist groups, there is no option for a woman. There is no conversation with her husband about what she wants. Now again, nothing wrong with living this way if that's the way you want to live. But when you're in a CULT or a high controlled group, sometimes what you want isn't even considered. Now before we get into the highly toxic teachings of the homeschooling program ATI, we do have to look at the seven life principles that make up the IBLP. Now these seven different principles on paper all look really good, but hopefully you will be able to see where these seven principles can be manipulated when given to the wrong person. I also want to note that Bill Gothard claims that in Bible study and research, he figured out that these were the seven principles of living a godly life. This is coming again from his perspective of the Bible. So let's get into it. So number one is design. God has a precise purpose for each person, object, and relationship that he creates. As we understand and live in harmony with his design, we will discover self-acceptance, identity, and fulfillment in life. I agree with that. God does have a precise purpose for each person, object, and relationship. However, that purpose, that dharma, as it's called in the East, is between you and God. Another human being should not have any part in that. Where in the IBLP, it does seem that actually Bill Gothard has a part in your purpose. The second principle is authority. God assigns various responsibilities to parents, church leaders, government officials, and other authorities. As we learn to acknowledge and honor these authorities, we can see God work through them to provide direction and protection in our lives. Honoring our authorities brings inward peace. Yes, we should be respectful of authorities. But when we put it, this into perspective, with the ABUSC allegations against both Bill Gothard, which we'll get into, and of course the horrific indictment of Josh Duggar and CP, this role of authority is dangerous. Number three is responsibility. God holds us accountable for every word, thought, action, attitude, and motive. When we offend others, asking for forgiveness and making proper restitution are essential steps to maintaining a clear conscience. Absolutely. If you mess up, say you're sorry. But again, we're going to see this a little differently when we look in what they consider to be sins and only sins and not actually crimes too. Number four is suffering. The hurts of the offenders can reveal our blind spots. God grants us grace for a personal cleansing growth and achievement as we learn to respond with full forgiveness to those who offend us. Again, this is going to be manipulated when it comes to CP, child SA, all those good words that I can't say on YouTube, but hopefully if you're watching this, you are already aware of what these words are. Number five is ownership. Everything we have been entrusted to us by God, and we are to use these resources wisely. Yielding our personal rights and expectations to God brings true security and enables us to overcome anger and worry. I agree with that. I agree we should have faith and trust in the universe or in God. You see this in a lot of spiritual teachings, not just Christianity. However, in this situation, where you have somebody who has assigned himself as the middleman for God, you're looking at yielding your personal rights and expectations to Bill Gothard. 
huge difference. Number six is freedom. Godly freedom is not the privilege to do what we want. Rather, godly freedom is the power to do what is right. Regaining ground that has been surrendered to sin brings moral purity, equipping us to serve others in genuine love. Yes, I do agree with that. In my church, there was this uh, billboard that we had in the Sunday school department that said, um, what is popular is not always right, and what is right is not always popular. And I definitely have been feeling that a lot lately with um, what's been going on in our world. And even though I grew up in a very conservative Christian Presbyterian church, an evangelical church, Compared to Bill Gothard's IBLP and some of these independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, my church was progressively liberal compared to this. All right, number seven, the last one, success. We can discover God's purpose in our lives by engrafting scripture into our hearts and minds, using it to think God's thoughts and to fill the foundation for making wise decisions. I have a huge issue with this when we are using it to think God's thoughts. That is putting a human modus operandi on something that is not human. This, in my opinion, is where we get a lot of the corruption within the church. We start to believe that the opinions we have on God's actions are correct when we have no idea the full understanding of God. God is so much greater and bigger than us mere mortals that to think we can actually understand that is very narcissistic, very egotistical, and frankly, wrong. We also know that within the IBLP, there is modest dress. This is especially important for girls. For many girls in this organization, they wear long dresses, no tank tops, no pants, long-haired, mostly curled because allegedly that's how Bill Gothard likes hair to be. We're going to get into that because we're going to look at some of these workbook pages from the ATI. Um, they even wear modest bathing suits if they're allowed to go to the beach, which is horrific in my opinion. I also want to note that according to people who grew up inside this organization, women are taught for the most part to take full responsibility for a man's indiscretion. Once more, in the description box down below, I have a whole list of testimonies from women who grew up in the IBLP. I did not, so this is just coming from what they have claimed. They dress extremely modest as not to defraud men. It was also stated by people who have been in the organization that girls are taught that God created men to have a sex addiction and they can't control it. Basically, it's how God made them. Such BS. Therefore, women are to be available to their husbands whenever their husbands want. And if their husbands cheat, it is the woman's fault for not being available enough to her husband. They also do not believe in marital R-A-P-E. And if you are R-A-P-E or M-O-L-E-S-T-E-D, you are to be grateful for your suffering. Remember, that's one of the principles of the seven principles of biblical life, according to Bill Gothard. Again, there are hundreds of testimonies about this, and this is specifically with the IBLP, not necessarily with all independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, but specifically with this organization. And again, just because this is very common within the organization does not mean that that's how every family raises their children. I've also included a link to a blog from Patheos called No Longer Quivering that was written by Suzanne Tinkemeyer. I hope I'm saying her last name correct. Um, she's a great resource because from my understanding, I think she was raised Catholic and then became part of this group of people and then has since left. And so she has a lot of really great perspectives on this from somebody who wasn't born into it, fell into it, and then fell out of it. And so I would highly suggest reading her blog. I think she also has a YouTube channel as well if you wanna get more of an idea from an insider. For a lot of these, uh, fundamentalist families associated with the IBLP and Bill Gothard, they don't listen to music or TV. And when I say they don't listen to music, 
I mean, they don't listen to secular music. Um, they are usually are taught to play an instrument, um, but they are cut off from like music from the outside world. There's another uh, podcast I've linked down in the description box below. Uh, I pray you put this journal away. I think is the title of the podcast, and it is a it is a journal. It is this this adult male and his wife are reading through the husband's journal when he was a child, a teenager, growing up with the Duggars. He was friends with the Duggars and he grew up in this environment. And it's really telling to read as he reads through what he was thinking and how his indoctrination was really ingrained into him as a child and there's a really funny part where they talk about how all these fundamentalist families have like family bands where they play like they rock out to like you know amazing grace but the kids won't know any like pop culture musicians which again i grew up in a very conservative christian home but we listened to my parents yeah you know, i was born in 1983 my parents um you know, their, their generation really was the 70s. So we listened to a lot of Led Zeppelin, which I actually have a Led Zeppelin shirt on today. My mother's favorite band is The Who. Um, you know, we grew up with secular music. I think cutting kids off from the outside world can all also be very, like, devastating to their overall being. Sometimes people have to leave the fold to get a job outside and just have no clue what's going on in the outside world just seems like a huge injustice to these kids. Obviously, they also don't like dancing. <laughs> There's an actual episode from 19 Kids and Counting where Jim Bob Duggar is talking about how dancing is like too provocative. So I've also heard from many of the people leaving testimonies that they have very little, if any, association with people outside of the organization, which is very much a CULT tactic, and especially if the kids are being homeschooled, so they're only around their family, they're not around any other kids, they're not away from their family, they're constantly at these churches or at home, they're totally indoctrinated, and if your beliefs are so right, if your beliefs are so correct, then you shouldn't have any fear sending your kids out in the world. Many people coming out of the IABLP have also claimed that they practice what is called shunning, which is also really common with CULTs. They don't call it shunning, but apparently they're taught to kind of like not associate with people who have left the organization. We see this a little bit from what we can tell from the outside with Jill Duggar Dillard, who was one of the Duggar kids, one of the 19 kids of 19 Kids Accounting, and it appears that she has started to separate herself from the IBLP. She sends her kids to public school. She only has two kids. Obviously, her and her husband are practicing birth control. She is starting to mingle her life with the outside secular world, but they're still very much Christian. However, it apparently is that she can't even go to her parents' house now without permission because they have decided to remove themselves from this fundamentalist group, even though they are still very conservative. They also practice something called courtship. This is wild to me. So in this organization, people do not date. They court. A boy will find a girl he, he likes, and then he'll ask her father if he can court her. Allegedly, the girl does have the power to say no if she doesn't want to court a guy, which I guess is something. Uh, while courting, they always are chaperoned. They cannot kiss, nor can they even text alone. A parent has to be in a text. Once engaged, they can hold hands. Most IBL families will not have their first kiss until they're at the altar. I think I said this in the last video. This is really uncomfortable if you watch the wedding episodes on 19 Kids and Counting and Counting On. It's like super awkward and kind of gross. It kind of perverts it all, in my opinion. But people have called this an, an S-E-X-C-U-L-T. Obviously, divorce is a big no-no. Um, according to insiders, if Anna Duggar were to leave Josh, so Josh's wife, Anna Duggar, which she has every right, she should have left a long time ago, I don't think any of us in the outside world would blame her for leaving. But according to what we have heard from insiders, if Anna Duggar were to leave because of Josh's charges, she would be the one who broke the covenant with her husband and God, not him. 
she would be the bad one. I don't even know what to say to that. That's disgusting. Obviously, they practice purity culture. Purity culture is horrible. It's awful. It's 100% toxic. And let me tell you something. If you're a Christian, the only purity you should believe in is the one that comes through Jesus. End of story. Period. Point blank. Not through your sexuality. Not through some guy like Bill Gothard who is a freaking deviant in his own right, which again we're going to get into. So please do not put your self-worth into your sexuality. You are worth so much more than that. So when you decide to do the ATI's homeschooling program, you have to buy what they call wisdom booklets. Now everything Bill Gothard teaches in the ATI does come from a focus of God. There's nothing wrong with that. You can teach a child academia with also focusing on God. However, there's a lot that they just don't teach children. In my opinion, kids coming out of the ATI do not have an education at all. We also see some very, very, very concerning lessons in these wisdom workbooks. And we're gonna look through some of the pages now. So we're gonna start with what is probably one of the most concerning of these workbook pages. As you can see, it says counseling, S-E-X-U-A-L-A-B-U-S-E. -E. Now, this is up on the screen. You can pause the video if you wanna read through the whole thing, but for now, I wanna focus on number four. Why did God let it happen? Result of defrauding. So remember, the victim isn't a victim. If you are, a, if you have unwanted attention on you, it's not because of the person giving you the attention, it's because of you, according to this teaching. So, were you dressed immodestly, indecent exposure? Were you out of the protection of your parents? Or were you with evil friends? That's super concerning. God does not let anything like that happen. As human beings, we are subject to free will. And unfortunately, stuff like this does happen and it shouldn't happen. But if it happens to you, it is not your fault. You are not responsible. So right here, we're gonna look at understanding the concept of the umbrella protection. So I spoke a little bit about this before, about your authority. And if you stay in line with your authority, that you will be in God's favor, basically. And if you're out of line with your authority, you're open to Satan. So here's something to kind of back that. So understand the concept of the umbrella of protection. And the umbrella of protection symbolizes the fact that as long as we are under God-given authority, nothing can happen to us that God does not design for his glory and ultimate good. It also illustrates the fact that when we get out from under authority, we expose ourselves to the realm and the power of Satan's control. It is for this reason that rebellion is at the sin of witchcraft. So, there's that. So if you don't mind your husband, if you're a woman, even if your husband is like beating the crap out of you, then you're not going to be in God's grace. That's pretty disgusting. And that's not what most Christians believe. All right, let's look at number six. Avoid eye traps. Eyes are attracted to skin. Low or plunging neckline shirts or blouses with several buttons open. Bare shoulder styles, sundresses, off the shoulder sleeves, strapless or halter tops. Slits in the skirt, bare backs and bare midriffs all draw the eye of the observer to see how far the opening goes. Bare leg designs such as short skirts or pants. Shorts draw the observer's attention to the legs. BS, I know many, many men, including my boyfriend, who are not distracted by that kind of stuff because they grew up around it. A girl's shoulders are just that, their shoulders. We all have them. See, the fault is always on the woman in this C-U-L-T. And can you imagine kids from the time they are born are raised to believe this is indoctrinated into them. There's no other opposing idea to say, wait a minute, don't you think it's weird that in this organization, the man has the power for everything except his own sexual identity? 
that's some heavy BS. Now there are far, 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 far more workbook sheets we could go through. However, for the sake of time, that's where I'm gonna leave it as far as that portion of this episode. If you join us on Tuesdays on the Dark Outpost, we will be going even deeper into these workbooks that they have with the ATI. There we are not censored, so we can talk openly about the issues that are coming up in these really toxic teachings. In 2004, Bill Gother did get his PhD from Louisiana Baptist University. And 10 years later, by 2014, things were not looking good for Bill Gothard. As my mother used to say to us growing up, be sure your sins will find you out, and they surely did for Bill Gothard. Now, I have linked an interview down below from the Preacher Boys podcast here on YouTube with Emily Elizabeth Anderson. Now, Emily Elizabeth Anderson was a girl who grew up in the IBLP, and she was one of the women who filed charges against Bill Gothard for a B U S C for lack of a better word. Her story about growing up in the IBLP is really, really interesting. And I do recommend you listening to her interview on the Pre Preacher Boys podcast down below. Now, just like a C-U-L-T, Emily speaks a lot about how Anderson was almost like a prophet to the followers. She said they never called him the prophet, but they would call him the modern day Paul, according to her. It was believed from the organization or certain members in the organization that he was one of the ones who was receiving divine messages from God. Sorry about the siren going off outside. According to Emily, Gothard would go up into a cabin in every January and like fast for 30 days where apparently he would receive all these new revelations from God. This just screams C-U-L-T to me. I'm sorry, but this is like poster child C-U-L-T leader. I don't know about you guys, but I, I just, it's, it's so uncomfortable that it's making me laugh a little bit. Now, I know fasting is a huge part of a lot of spiritual practices. It's big in yoga as well. However, sometimes when we have psychological disorders like perhaps maybe allegedly narcissism going without food or putting any type of like derangement on the mind can cause the psychological disorder to get worse so i actually don't believe that bill gothard was receiving any messages from god because i think if he was receiving actual messages from god it would be god telling him to stop doing this to his children. It was pretty clear from Emily that Gothard also kind of had this idea that his way was the only way and was the right way, which again is another sign of a C-U-L-T. Emily talked a lot about the ATI, how when you join the ATI, you have to basically sign a contract with the IBLP or Bill Gothard claiming you won't do certain things. And one of these things is to have a TV, which I understand, like I know the media is fake, just like everybody else knows that it's all BS. But to make someone not have a TV or access to the outside world is definitely a form of isolation. And we see this heavily with the IBLP, which again is another sign of a CULT. Emily talked a lot about the financial strain that the IBLP and the ATI have on their members of the organization, and they made a reference to Scientology that a lot of what the IBLP does is exactly like Scientology. The ATI costs a lot of money to buy all these books, and you're constantly having to buy more and more and more stuff. Again, this was a lot like Scientology. And once more, when we're looking at CULTs, financial strain is a huge red flag when it comes to these nefarious organizations. Now again, be sure your sins will find you out because in 2014, Bill Gothard's sins started to find him out. On the 27th of February of 2014, the board of directors put Bill Gothard on a temporary leave. 
several, several women, I believe the number was 34, but I'm not 100% sure, claimed and made allegations that Bill Gothard had harassed them in a very, um, in a very seductive type way, if you get what I'm saying. These claims appeared on a website called Recovering Grace. I have the website linked down below. There's also resources on this website if you are coming out of a high controlled group. So they are a great resource for anybody. And I did a lot of my research off of their website as well. So I would really suggest that everyone check that website out. On the 17th of June, 2014, so only a few months later, the IBLP made a statement that they had used outside legal counsel to investigate the claims made against Gothard. They stated no criminal activity was found, but they acknowledged that Gothard had acted in an inappropriate manner and quote unquote, he is not permitted to serve in any counseling, leadership, or board role within the IBLP ministry. In 2015, Gothard did relaunch his own website and he shared a lot of testimonies from other women. It kind of seemed like he was kind of giving all these victims the middle finger. But by 2016, Gothard and the IBLP found themselves in a lawsuit against a lot of victims who had alleged that Gothard had SA'd them. The lawsuit was dropped because of the statute of limitations, not because the charges were dropped due to them not being legitimate, but because they were running against time, basically. Now, Bill Gothard is no longer, as, as stated, really a part of the IBLP in theory. But if you look on the IBLP's website, which again, I have placed down in the description box below, he still seems to be very much a part of this organization, even if he's just this mystical figurehead that all of a sudden is no longer really around. From what I know, Bill Gothard is still alive. He is well into his 80s. Now, as I said in Josh Duggar's video, many organizations, Christian organizations, have basically shunned the IBLP, have spoken out against it, that this is not legitimate Christianity, which I happen to very much agree that this is not legitimate Christianity. This is a CULT. And one way to determine whether something is a destructive organization like a CULT or just a basic organization is the BITE model. The IBLP scores very, very, very high on the BITE model. And the BITE model stands for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. I think the BITE model is one of the most genius things to come out of our modern time. I'm going to have another website placed in the description box that goes over the BITE model in more detail and has some resources for anybody who thinks that they might be in a high controlled situation that's toxic and they need to get out. Please visit this website. Now, I don't think I need to go through every category to prove to you that the IBLP scores high in the BITE model. I think just going over the basis that we did today in this episode is pretty easy to tell, even as an outsider looking in, that this is a very high controlled group. And unfortunately, in high controlled group, there is a lot of trauma. No doubt that the allegations that were filed against Josh Duggar for CP will probably shed light on even more issues coming out of the IBLP than we know now. And hopefully there can be some healing in families that have found themselves involved in this dangerous organization. Once more, if you do feel like you might possibly be in a church or a yoga studio or any type of organization that might be exhibiting some of the same behaviors as the IBLP, then please, please, please seek help. There are so many churches out there. There are so many yoga studios out there. There are so many organizations out there that are really good, that will not try to control you. 
I want to conclude this video by saying please don't send hate to anybody. A lot of these families involved in the IVLP are good people who have just gotten themselves tied up in a really toxic organization. Please be loving and kind to every person that you meet. And remember to keep Anna Duggar, her children, and all the people involved in the Josh Duggar case in your thoughts and prayers. Now again, normally this is not something I would do on this channel. For those who are normally a part of this channel, you know that we typically cover more fringe topics. However, I am thinking about doing a couple more deep dives into a couple more people that are involved in extreme fundamentalism. I know a lot of people think we always go after the Catholic Church because in a lot of these conspiracies or fringe topics, the Catholic Church seems to be at the center of all the shenanigans. But because this is tied to a Protestant faith, maybe it is fair that we go into a couple of more people that are definitely showing signs of narcissism and perhaps toxic behavior within religious circles. Please let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. As always, please remember to be super respectful and kind to each other. When we're dealing with faith and religion, it can get very, very prickly, and people can get very, very defensive. I myself am not attacking the Christian faith at all. That's my own faith. I'm not going to attack it. I'm attacking a person that, in my opinion, has really, really hurt people through his own derangement. All right, guys, I hope that you have a wonderful day, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.